Hello, I'm Mark Belluz, the president of ISSMGE, the International Society for Soil Mechanics and Geotechnical Engineering. I'm here today in Austin, Texas, beautiful weather, for the third IITT, International Interactive Technical Talk, with uh, great speakers that I will introduce in a little bit. I just want to remind you that uh, these talks, as I promised during my electoral campaign, have the goal of bringing together different engineers of different age, of different gender, from different geographical areas to discuss a specific topic. And we're trying to cover all the aspects of geotechnical engineering uh, uh, by going through the technical committees of ISSMGE. Today is about the technical committee TC308, uh, which is a dear and important uh, topic to me on uh, geothermal and geotechnical uh, uh, energy, energy geotechnics. And we have great speakers. The luckily, the the chair of uh, TC three hundred eight with us, Dr. Guillermo Nasillo. He is uh, a professor and the deputy head, infrastructure engineering director of Area P PTY, director fourth element energy, and chair of TC three hundred eight. And more importantly. Uh, he received, uh, when he was young, the ISS MGE Outstanding Award for the Young Engineers. And uh, he's a professor in now, uh, uh, he's a professor, help me, in uh, uh, Australia. <laughs> so uh, good morning to you. It's a uh, good afternoon for me and uh, good afternoon to Camilla and uh, good evening to Lulia. Camelia, Dr. Camelia Atifi is an assistant uh, professor at York University in Ontario. She's a secretary of the Technical Committee 308 on Energy Geotechnics. And uh, she, her specialty is geomechanics of coupled processes of design for design of geothermal operations. Also with us, Dr. Yulia Consuela from Romania and uh, she's a co-founder of three companies big business woman uh, <laughs> green tags in uh, Romania for uh, and uh, structural software um, she she's a lecturer at the Technical University of choose no Nopacho. no pacha <laughs> sorry um, and uh, what uh, really I really like about uh, her uh, CV was her mission statement that she said, we need to devote ourselves to contribute to making life better for people, society and our planet. Even if as engineers, we should stop bragging about bigger structures and projects. We are ruining the earth and concentrate on saving what we have and saving the energy and uh, the planet uh, uh, using smart energy, which is the topic of this lecture. Then I like uh, Dr. Guillermo to start telling us a little bit about the principles of uh, the specialty. And we keep with uh, going with the other speakers. And I may interrupt you with a few questions as the moderator. Don't Absolutely. be upset. Because no, I don't no, know much great. about this subject. Well, thank you for that <laughs> all kind yours, Guillermo. Yeah, thank you for that kind of introduction of all of us and for the invitation to our TC to, to share what we have learned or we're learning about this important topic. I'd like to start by uh, you know, provoking a bit of, of the thoughts of people uh, listening to us. I, I think that we can all agree that some of the key challenges of the 21st century is managing energy resources and moving towards cleanliness and sources of energy. But we need to keep in mind that energy transition may last decades and we cannot just change overnight the way we do go about satisfying energy demand. Now here in this plot, we see carbon emission per capita as a function of wealth, a function of GDP per capita. And we can see two things. Um, those who have low carbon emissions really lack access to energy. 
And as we move to better standards of life or uh, quality of life, as someone we call it, the wealth increase, also carbon emission increase, but these are too high if you want to avoid severe climate change. Now, over the years, people have moved uh, from this um, uh, paper area to this at the expense of, of, of higher carbon emissions to sustain that uh, higher quality of life. Now, over the last 30 years, the total uh, carbon dioxide emission has increased, as you can see here, for about 20 to 40 billion uh, tons of carbon dioxide uh, emitted a year. That's about 5.5 tons per person. Now, the CO2 path which reached the Paris Agreement's goals are based on the necessary reductions of these, of these trends. Okay? And as you can see here, if, if we peaked in 2020, just before the pandemic at, uh, at this amount, uh, the Paris Agreement goal is to really keep the increase to global temperatures well below two degrees, um, above pre-industrial levels, and also to pursue efforts to limit the increase to 1.5 uh, degrees globally. As you can see, this effort, <laughs> The effort requires at a global scale is phenomenal. We really need to change that trend with very steep curves. Limited temperature to 1.5 will require a five-fold decrease, 80% decrease in our energy uh, carbon emission from 9.95 per person by 2030. Um, the absolute limit or the mass cap of two degrees that represents a reduction of 20 to 25%. Uh, that's quite a lot. Now, what are the sources of these emissions? Well, we can see in this chart here that fossil fuels... One more. Um, sorry to interrupt. Can you sure. go back to the sure. slide? Uh, that uh, drop at the highest peak, and was it due to the COVID pandemic? The, 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 the Paris Agreement was signed just before COVID, and the estimation was by 2021, we have 41 billion tons and 5.5 tons. Now, this happened actually a bit earlier. The pandemic uh, made this go down a little bit. This drop here is what the projections are uh, from, from where we are a, about now. Yeah. So this, this is not That's actual. This is pretty optimistic. We have to. Yes. This no, is, the uh, actual is uh, the red one. The red the dots, right? Is, yeah. So the trend is upwards. And you can see this slope is, well, not gentle, but it is what it is. The reverting of the trend, desire or Absolutely, absolutely what we have to achieve. The, the slope is, ha is, is twice as steep. So we need to revert it at a very <laughs> high speed. Yeah, yeah. Now the sources okay, of this, keep um, going. Yeah, the sources of these uh, carbon emissions are uh, mostly coming from, from the way we generate uh, energy. And you can see the changes in the um, distribution of, of sources over the last four years. Uh, although the the total amount of energy and um, produce is, is has increased dramatically. Uh, the percentage of fossil fuels has remained more or less the same, 60% all throughout. Uh, there is an increase in renewable energies over the last 10 years, perhaps at the expense of a reduction in nuclear energy. This trend may change, given that we need to satisfy our energy demands. Uh, and the geopolitical situation nowadays is pushing into, into that direction. The important bit for us, geotechnical engineers, is that uh, what we see on, on the right here, a picture taken from the state of the art uh, report that Carlos Santamarina presented in our last international conference in Sydney. And, and geotechnical engineers have some involvement in, in fossil fuels, oil, gas, coal, in renewables, geothermal, hydro, wind, solar, in nuclear, and in mining of, of, of coal, as well as uh, minerals for electrical batteries, for example. So we can and we must make a contribution um, to, to, this, um, to this mission. Now, within the technical committees, that's what we're doing. And, and we, we tackle a number of, of, of different topics within. Uh, and we have nine, at the moment, nine technical forces covering from fundamentals of geoenergy uh, all the way to energy storage or a, a conventional carbon, uh, hydrocarbon um, recovery. We also have professional task forces, public outreach, and members, awards, and importantly, Industry Academy Partnership in Innovation. If you want to learn more about uh, our TC missions and, and want to join us, please scan the QR code on the, on the right. We are also going to have been a meeting, technical meeting covering all of these aspects in next year, in, in October, in the Netherlands. Uh, please join us uh, there as well. The symposium and the conference are the two flagships 
events that the TC organized. Now, out of all of the nine force tax forces, there are half of them that deal with heat energy. Uh, now, uh, Maria Victoria Villar is the task force leader for the higher level radiative weight disposal. There was an interactive uh, technical talk uh, earlier this month. We have a new or emerging task force um, uh, on harnessing uh, underground climate change, uh, harnessing the waste energy uh, that um, that we generate in, in the urban environment in the ground. And uh, Dr. Rasavogera Max is, is leading that that effort here from Australia. And um, the energy geostructures and storage of thermal energy in the ground. The talk is today, technical talk, led by um, Dr. Fleur Loveridge, who has done a fantastic job as a task force leader, leader over the past few years. So we're going to dwell more into energy geostructures and present a brief overview of what it is and then what we have learned so far. And for that, I'm going to come back to where I started. I said that managing energy resources and moving towards cleaner sources of energy were some of the key challenges of this century. Now, according to published data, heating and cooling account for half of the final energy consumption. But luckily, there are technologies such as deep and shallow geothermal energy that can be used as alternative renewable low carbon emission energy sources. Today, we're going to focus on this shallow um, part. A ground store heat pan system or a shallow geothermal energy system take advantage of the relatively constant temperature of the ground throughout the year. For the case of Melbourne, where I live, it's around 18 degrees throughout the year. In Seoul, in South Korea, it's about 11 degrees throughout the year. Now, this is a schematic showing how shallow geothermal system works in general, using the ground as a heat source or a heat sink. As you can see, there is a heat pump that is connected to pipes that are embedded into the ground with a circulating fluid, typically water or water entropy solution, that exchanges heat, heat with the ground. This is a traditional design where pipes are embedded into, uh, into boreholes that need to be purposely drilled uh, for, for being part of the geothermal system. However, drilling these ground heat exchangers is expensive making the capital cost of this system to be high, even though the operational costs are much lower. For every one kilowatt of electricity we use in the heat pump, we obtain between five and up to seven kilowatts of thermal energy. So it's quite efficient to operate, but the capital costs are high. Traditionally, we use vertical boreholes or trenches um, as ground heat exchangers, huh? but we can also use piles, walls, labs, tunnel lines, um, for, for these purposes. In general, any structure that is in contact with the ground can be converted into a ground heat exchanger model. Now, we discussed this more in detail in a review paper in 2019, and later in a position paper by the TC uh, in 2020. This is a piece of work led by Professor um, Flair Loveridge uh, on behalf of the TC. So basically... Question, I want to interrupt you. Tell me. <laughs> it's an interactive technical talk. So yes. from what I see and my humble experience, if you have a building that require foundation pipes, shouldn't we encourage all the time to have those pipes instrumented with geothermal exchange and and tubes <laughs> I, I or that, uh, uh, yeah. the question is we have to be careful because it depends on ground conditions and water table i'm gonna go back to, to this uh, uh this little sentence here the answer is yes we uh, and this is perhaps what we wanted to achieve uh, in this technical talk it's so simple in the end to add some this plastic by hdp pipe to to the foundations of, of our buildings it's relatively cheap. It's not expensive and, to add those pipes. Pardon me? It wouldn't be expensive to do it at the beginning because you mentioned the first capital investment <laughs> is high, but it may not be if you have to do the piles anyways. Absolutely. And and that that's that, that's the key point here. We don't need to drill purposely borehole to put the pipes in. The drilling is already happened because we have the piles. So we just add the pipes in. So, so, so the, the short answer to your question is yes, we will encourage at least to consider these, this lower capital cost. It's not, uh, it's not complicated. And 
most ground condition will will be will be okay. Uh, we need to be all, only careful in maybe dealing with normally consolidated clays, but but that's something that perhaps we're going to mention later in the in in, uh, in the talk today, Mark. Yeah. So basically, this is it. You know, we can use underground structures to that have all the private reports and grant feed exchanges as we build them. Therefore, we have no drain costs associated with the geothermal system per se. This reduces capital cost of the system. We have pipe foundations, the the, walls, the tubes. Yeah, you can see the, the tubes uh, yeah. right there. Yes, because they look like they're enforcement, but they're not. I see also in the tunnel. It's amazing. Yeah, uh, so you can see. I saw here a presentation the... by Professor Lalwi also talking about this. Yes, Lalwi is the VP of ISSMGE in Europe. It's also his uh, specialty. Great. Yes, and, and he's a member of the TC as well. And, and uh, yes, I want to be. Uh, there are many people around the world doing work on on this area. We're trying to summarize some of the work here. But uh, Lalwi, thank um, God, <laughs> there are a number. There are a number of people. Thankfully, uh, yes. Now, there are some barriers to implementation. I think that you, you, you mentioned um, lack of awareness, maybe one of them. Uh, there is also a lack of, in general, a standardized design approach and limited local design and construct a knowledge base. Now, these barriers to implementation vary around the world, but this is the audience here is, is the world. So, so there, are, there are differences. There are also lack of, in general, lack of policy and tender documents that uh, mandate the consideration, at least, of geothermal technologies in infrastructure projects. You just point out something on these lines, Mark. There is, in many places, a lack of direct governing incentives or rebates. Now, there are green or innovation ratings that may play a role, and there are places that do have um, rebates or incentives, so helping with some of the subsidies of the cost. From an industry perspective, my experience here in Australia has been, and in other parts of the world, that there is a perceived risk in project implementation and potentially related to the program, the construction programs. And I think that Julia will, will, will talk more in detail about this um, in, her, in, her, in her bits. So what do Guillermo, we do about this? Yes. Uh, these, fro these four sentences are due to, in my opinion, to one main reason. The topic is relatively new. And that's why all three speakers with me today are young. <laughs> all three of you are young because you. it's a new topic. So you should expect the research to be followed by implementation after maybe 30, 40 years. It's normal. So don't be discouraged. It's coming. <laughs> We're not. Keep going. <laughs> Marcelo Sanchez created a TC 10 years ago, 12 years ago. And, and uh, we I was there been... at the meeting, right. yeah. Uh, but you will see that the product has been made uh, and um, hold that thought. You, I'll show you some examples here and Julia and, and Camille will show you some, some of it as well. Yeah, by the way, I want to I wanna say thank you to Professor Marcelo Sanchez because he is the one organizing all these technical talks. He is the chair of uh, the technical overhead committee now at ISSMG. Uh, we're all ears, Guillermo. Yes, yeah, so, so so what do we do about about, about this? And, and it's related to what you just said. We go out, we design, we build, we show, and we tell. So people is aware. So you can see here another example where we have, and it's hard to see, right? The geothermal pipes or AGP pipe embedded in, 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 the, in, in the walls. These are some of the things that we like to hear from industry at the end of the project. Oh, it was easy. They were not delayed to the program. Uh, so, so this is this shows that we can um, we can do it and we can do it effectively. I'm going to very briefly show other examples of energy structures that we have been installed at Melbourne Uni uh, for the last five to ten years. So we can use uh, screw piles and convert them into um, energy piles. What you can see here is some of the reticulation. The pipes going to a central location where the heat pump will be eventually in this building. Uh, we can use roads and car parks to convert them into energy payments or energy roads. Uh, here is an example in Adelaide. Uh, slabs of buildings, you can see in this thick slab at the bottom, we have embedded some geothermal patch to harness that uh, energy, or exchange that thermal energy in the ground. Driven piles, energy tunnels, and this is the case, uh, and you can see now the tubes there, more in detail, Mark, um, and everyone. Um, uh, this is the carbon type um, tunnel, but uh, Professor Barla group and Alessandri Sana and others. 
um, in Italy, for instance, has uh, come out also with this technique of doing this for TDM uh, tanning as well. Um, solid piles uh, here in Melbourne, the Melbourne Metro project, uh, we have some, some trials uh, undergoing and we just thermally activated a, a section of the shaft of one of the stations uh, there. And, and uh, Camille will talk about more on simulations and, and how we go about the design, but, but here we can see the exchange of heat with the ground in a detailed modeling uh, that we have performed. Um, this is the, the retaining wall being thermally activated and this is the, the the, the basement of the space uh, there and, and the temperature of the ground and the temperature of the fluid that we uh, pit the heat pump with in a balanced thermal load is, is really um, benign throughout the year. Oh, this is, well, I'm going to pay for a little while. The project with, 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 with the industry here is also to demonstrate. So, just summarizing my, my little bit here, the key message is that energy structures, the parts, the walls, the, the slabs, are technically feasible. Now, today, some case-by-case -case studies are still necessary, and we may still use advanced modeling techniques to, to deal with them, and they will lead to Camellia's, Camellia's talk. I mentioned very briefly the balance of the thermal load distribution is favorable for the thermal performance and the capital cost of these structures, but if we have groundwater flow, we, we don't care. We can do, uh, we can satisfy even unbalanced thermal load, a lot of quitting or a lot of cooling. Cooperation between different buildings, companies, entities might be necessary to achieve a successful implementation, as collaboration. There are still some barriers to implementation, lack of awareness is one of them. These are overcome, as you well pointed, Mark, through R&D and full-scale demonstrations. And we know that first movers may be winners here, and you will see going from um, theory to engineering practice, and Julia will we, we point that out. And it's great to see our contractors saying that, you know, it was easy, it was not related to the program. Um, and with that, probably I'm gonna just hand over now to, to, to the next speaker. And the world I represent is, is, you know, has been not done only by myself, but a lot of people around the world, a lot of people helping me here at Melbourne University. <laughs> So with that, if you don't have any further questions or comments, I would pass it on to, to Camelia. Okay, uh, thank you, Guillermo. Um, I'm going to continue the talk uh, on uh, focusing on the geomechanical aspect of uh, the geothermal energy piles and energy um, geothermal energy systems as well as energy piles. And why is it important, basically, to do the modeling and why is, what is the objective at the end? Uh, but before getting into the modeling, I would like to talk about a bit of a background. Uh, there are three main processes uh, that uh, are coupled and are involved directly in geothermal systems as well as uh, energy structures. Uh, these processes are uh, thermal processes, mechanical processes, and hydraulic processes. Uh, depending on what type of formation we are dealing with and what um, institute conditions we have, the type of coupling could be very, very complex. And at the end of the day, would uh, could be beneficial to what we want to obtain uh, to achieve at the end, or it could cause um, a negative point to what we want to achieve. So the ultimate goal here is to understand these processes, to be able to predict them, as well as to be able to control them, to get the most sustainable design, uh, effective design, and environmentally friendly design at the end. Uh, so, but to give briefly a background, if we have a, 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 a pore pressure change. Uh, uh, it will cause changes in effective stress. Changes in effective stress will cause, on the other hand, a volumetric response of the formation. We call it the mechanical response, and it's going to affect in situ pore pressures. That's why we call it coupling. As uh, likewise, if we have a change in the pore pressure, uh, this could uh, actually generate uh, temperature uh, processes such as thermal filtration. Thermal filtration um, flow is sort of um, a non-traditional thermal uh, process that happens in very low uh, permeable formations, but it could still happen and be substantial depending on the conditions that we have. Uh, any kind of thermal load that we apply to the structure or to the medium, uh, uh, as soon as it's saturated, it's going to cause pore pressure changes and bring about processes such as thermal osmosis, and therefore it's important to be taken into account. Likewise, on the mechanical aspect, uh, any kind of thermal load will result into either expansion or contraction of uh, the, the medium. 
and any expansion or contraction of the medium likewise could go back and impact uh, a, a, a thermal sink or a, um, a thermal source as well. But the, the, this final process is not very typical in tradition in, in, in standard geotechnical engineering. So moving on after the background, uh, I would like to talk a bit more about the um, geothermal systems. Uh, we have two types of energy storage. We have shallow uh, energy storage and deep energy storage. Uh, my work uh, is mainly concerned with deep energy storage. However, the principles are very, very similar. The idea is to get uh, to, um, to use um, basically other resources of energy so, uh, and, and convert it into temperature and therm uh, thermal energy and store it into uh, geomaterials. This can be done either at shallower depths. It can be done in aquifers. Uh, that's that's that uh, common practice, um, uh, that um, state of the art practice, or it can be done a bit deeper um, and combined with the solar energy um, into uh, reservoirs. So it is uh, somehow typical if we uh, couple solar energy because solar energy is a good source of energy, is sustainable, however, it's intermittent, uh, to convert that into thermal energy and then store it into the geomaterials. Um, well, one common way is to heat the water, inject it deep into a reservoir. What is a reservoir? A reservoir is a porous formation which is surrounded by impermeable rocks. And therefore, as long as the leakage integrity of the ceiling layers is preserved, any fluid that is there can be maintained. So that is a perfect way for us to store things, including heat. Now, um, if we need to understand what is happening in the reservoir. As soon as we are injecting large volumes of fluids into the reservoir, we are generating pore pressures that will generate a volumetric response. It's going to um, increase uh, result into effective stress changes, and it could uh, generate forces on the interface between the reservoir and the ceiling layers. If this exceeds, they could result into the break breakage and the leakage of uh, the contaminant into the formation. Now, um, if um, Another side effect is uh, once, uh, as soon as we are injecting large volumes of fluids or we are extracting large volumes of fluids, we are generating subsurface deformations. These subsurface deformations is going to be translated to the surface. And in some cases, this could be substantial. A very good example is the Varaki geothermal field in New Zealand, which uh, if you look at the graph here on the top right hand side, over the period of 50 years, uh, because of uh, geothermal uh, energy production, it underwent almost 15 meters of subsidence in the field. Um, so we should be able to predict uh, the type of operation that we are doing as soon as it involves applying ther thermal loads or introducing large volumes of fluid into the subsurface, we need to be able to predict all this. Another effect is induced seismicity. So, um, an example is uh, the earthquake of 5.5 uh, uh, that was uh, reported in Pohang, South Korea in 2017. And uh, afterwards, there was a research done and it was proven that uh, it, because, because of a geothermal, enhanced geothermal system uh, project that was being conducted nearby, a fault was activated and this earthquake happened. Uh, so any kind of Again, these types of projects, we need to be able to understand what is the processes involved, because at the end of the day, we want to uh, come up with a more environmentally friendly, sustainable way of um, uh, storing energy and um, uh, utilizing energy. But we have to be mindful of the possible geoenvironmental implications. So at the end of the day, it is very important to be able to co uh, control the temperature, pressure and deformations, whether it's in geothermal systems or it is in um, energy geothermal structures. Now, um, another aspect when we talk about uh, storing thermal energy in the ground, in aquifers, um, we need to think about uh, in situ finds. A porous formation, if you look at the figure here on the top, uh, on the sorry, bottom right hand side, uh, that, that, that shows us a typical pore into the porous formation, into the ground. And we have fine particles situated within the pores. That, that is the nature of a geomaterial. As soon as we are injecting fluids or we are heating the formation, these particles start to get mobilized and they will flow uh, and they will get to smaller pores and clog it. So this will result into um, uh, basically decline in the productivity and negative impact on the whole efficiency of the project that we are dealing with. The stability of this uh, um, 
fine particles is determined by basically uh, uplift forces, gravity forces, electrostatic forces, and drag force. The electrostatic one is specifically uh, sensitive to temperature. So when we are uh, subjecting the thermal loads to the porous formation, that could mobilize uh, the, the fine particles and would result into the clogging of the formation. Okay, so now I would like to introduce um, just briefly to show the governing equations that we use. So the whole idea is to be able to predict uh, what is the temperatures, what are the pore pressures, and what, is, what are the stress or strain changes in the pile, in the soil around it, or if you are talking about uh, aquifers uh, during thermal energy storage, to be able to predict this and to make sure the system is efficient. So these are the, the general system of governing equations just for, um, for you folks to uh, to see the parameters involved. I'm not going to go over it. Let's go to the next slide. <clears throat> and this is an example of a general solution that's um, uh, working with my team. We obtained this a new solution. As you can see, it incorporates the pressure, uh, the, the temperature of the solid phase, the temperature of the fluid phase, and it has nine coefficients, and the coefficients are very complex. They do have um, uh, the properties of the solid phase, the fluid phase, and um, uh, the characteristic media of the porous formation in general. So examples of this solution here, uh, we did some verification of an experimental data set from Francisco from 2009. Uh, so this was a, a boom clay uh, that was subjected to heaters for three years and the temperature change and the pressure changes were monitored over the years. So as you can see, the, the data uh, here is showing pore pressure variations over the period of um, uh, days. And um, the, do the dotted lines are the experimental data and we, we were able, the new solutions, to be able to predict these high pore pressures. So these are key wide. Uh, these are important because as soon as we are subjecting the formation uh, to temperature changes, we could generate very high pore pressures. And these pore pressures, especially if the formation is very low permeable, um, it will uh, happen at early times, but then it's going to dissipate over time. So we are we need to be able to capture this and make sure that um, uh, everything is within the acceptable range. Another objective is to uh, uh, predict the temperature changes that is happening in the formation uh, using the numerical and analytical tools. Okay, um, another example is using uh, to just show what's the effect of fine migration. Uh, you can see the uh, the, the models, uh, our models is able to predict basically the concentration of the attached particle, the suspended particles and the strained particles. And as soon as we have strained particles, we will have a reduction in the permeability of the soil. And the reduction in the permeability of the soil will generate increase in pore pressure. So as you can see here, the dotted lines uh, show um, the induced pore pressures incorporating uh, fine uh, particle mobilization and it's showing much higher pore pressures compared to a case where there is no fine particle mobilization. So these are another um, cons considerations that need to be incorporated. Moving on to the energy piles. Um, similarly, the, the thermal hydromechanical behavior of the system is, uh, it needs to be studied. So we need to remember that at the end of the day, the pile is designed to tolerate building loads. That's, that's the main objective. That has not to be compromised. The second objective is to get the optimal thermal performance. So we need to uh, make sure that both the thermal performance and the mechanical performance of the energy pile systems are satisfied. Here on the left-hand side, uh, sorry, could we go back? The parameters that we need to incorporate when it comes to design is the pile length and diameter. Typically, we would want the pile length to be um, deeper. Uh, in order to get to, especially if you are uh, in colder climates, uh, the shallower part of the ground will experience temperature changes over the duration of the year. Uh, uh, we need to uh, go deep, deeper to make sure that we are relatively within the constant temperature zone of the ground. Uh, pile material and thermal properties also affect significantly the performance of the system and the heat transfer. Uh, the pipe configuration, the spacing and the number is another parameter that affects the, the system efficiency. Uh, the fluid rate that we are injecting and the type of the fluid itself also is another parameter to take in, into incorporation. On the right-hand side are the parameters that we cannot control, are in-situ parameters, but we have to design for them. Uh, so it's the strategic, the different types of the soil, the mechanical, thermal properties. 
sometimes the certain soils are very much temperature sensitive. Uh, so it is in, uh, important to incorporate their characteristic change over time because of temperature. Uh, existence of water table as well as climatic laws is also another factors that uh, needs to be incorporated when it comes to the design of energy piles. Uh, just uh, to briefly show basically uh, the behavior of an energy pile because of a thermal load, um, we can see two case scenarios side by side. The one on the left it shows us an energy pile. Uh, a pile that is actually pre-pile, it's um, a friction pile that is subjected to thermal loads under heating. Under heating, you can see the pile starts to expand and uh, it's going to expand from above the neutral line and uh, the same way from below it to try to, uh, to expand. As a result, the side friction response is going to be generated in an opposite direction from top to down from the uh, first top part of the pile and vice versa from the bottom. And we will see a certain deformation following that generated. On the cooling, everything is going to be vice versa. So as soon as we have a, a pile subjected to cooling, uh, we will have a shrinkage of the pile. And as a result, we will have uh, the, the friction um, of uh, the skin friction of the pile uh, being implemented in, in, in an opposite direction. So here are some calculations just to show on the interface between pile and soil is important for us to understand the pile soil interaction and how the parameters is going to change. You can see the response uh, top left shows uh, the basically the stress path, which is the mechanical response adjacent to the uh, uh, pile when it's subjected to a temperature load of 25 degrees Celsius. And the left, the, the right hand side, it shows when you're cooling the pile and it's a temperature gradient of minus 25 degrees Celsius. And you can see a completely different response of the formation, depending if it's a very low permeable formation, uh, it has a light, uh, high, high percentage of clay and involves certain Amelia? more complicated processes. Yes. Yes. These uh, curves are theoretical curves. Correct. Not measured, right? Just so the clarify. model was, uh, yeah, these are theoretical. The model was verified against a real case. And then we used to do a sensitivity analysis. So this is the, the result of a sensitivity analysis. So the first thing in the modeling is to calibrate it and verify it against a real okay. case. Otherwise, we cannot use to do any kind of study with those models. So these uh, have undergone the process of sensitivity analysis and curve matching. Well, the, the original model has been done uh, um, verification against an actual experimental study and then because we what, adopt the model. This is the beauty of geotech. What we expect sometimes doesn't happen. <laughs> and yeah. you, you get to other results. Uh, That's a great point because in reality... Yeah, be careful with the time because we're running out of yeah, time. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm almost there. Okay. okay um, and then the, these are some general considerations uh, to be incorporated when we're designing uh, for the geothermal energy piles. Uh, uh, one uh, point uh, to consider is when we have a group pile, the behavior is gonna be much more complex and, and how to activate thermal piles or not and the impact of piles with respect to one another, that is something to consider. Uh, and the performance is basically governed by uh, the soil tie water table and local climate. So, um, and just I would like to conclude that uh, the coupled thermal hydraulic mechanical processes are very important uh, when it comes to any type of energy related uh, process, including uh, geothermal systems. And thank you. I have one question. Thank you, Camilla. Uh, coming from the background of petroleum engineering, when you were talking about the fine grain migration and clogging, if you are injecting vertically into the aquifer for thermal exchange, uh, was any consideration given to horizontal or directional drilling to spread horizontally? Into the so this is for a vertical wellbore. We didn't incorporate the horizontal because we could have two different types of wellbore, especially in petroleum. Uh, I also started my background in petroleum, so I, I know uh, what you're talking about. Uh, so uh, yeah, these these, these it should be considered. It's more efficient to 
exchange heat horizontally. I think. That, that's true. That could be definitely an advantage, but I think that the, we have to also uh, consider the, the cost for uh, digging the horizontal bell bores. Yes. I think it's uh, Yulia's turn. <laughs> Thank you, Camelia. Hi. So I will try to share the screen. Just let me know if you can see it. Yes. Yeah, we can see it. Thank you. All right. So thank you. Uh, thank you again uh, for the kind invitation to be here with you today. Even if it's too late, uh, I think, uh, you know, it's great to have these discussions and I'm happy to be part of these interactive talks. Uh, my job is to do the translation from uh, theory to practice. So uh, I think that when we move from theory to practice, uh, sometimes we hit I would say a very tough world and um, in some ways it can be simpler uh, in some other ways it can be more complicated simpler because uh, especially when we talk about uh, energy geostructures uh, in practice the discussions are very pragmatic it's about numbers it's about the return of investment it's about clear benefits that we can bring to the client and then more complicated because, uh, as Mark was uh, uh, mentioning a few minutes ago, uh, when we can have the most complicated numerical uh, approaches, but at the end of the day, we need to ask ourselves uh, to what extent uh, we can capture the real behavior of operational environment uh, of the structures that we are numerically modeling. So this is uh, this is definitely a challenge. Of course, these are open uh, discussions, so we can uh, we can discuss uh, on them. However, um, in all this, when we talk about energy geostructures, I think it's important to highlight the role of geotechnical engineers because I do think that it is us that do have the knowledge and the background to to design and implement this type of structures, and I think that we do have two important roles that I think we need to highlight. So, of course, the first one is ensuring the safety of uh, the site, the safety of the foundation of the SAPRA structure. Uh, and when we talk about safety, I would say that uh, uh, our business as geotechnical engineers is not about dealing with soils. I think we are in the business of saving lives. And uh, I think this is something that we need to express more towards uh, the society and towards the general public when we talk about our impact in the society. And then the second role, when, when we talk about energy geostructures, uh, we are in charge of creating new local renewable energy sources for the community, providing them energy at lower costs than uh, conventional sources such as gas or others. So with that being said, uh, I would like to, because we are in interactive talks, uh, uh, I, cannot, uh, I cannot not say it. I have uh, two things that, uh, uh, one that uh, you, uh, Mark, said, the fact that uh, the topic uh, is new of energy geostructures. I would say the topic is not new at all, especially in terms of research. However, uh, when we compare it uh, with the uh, solar panels, for example, because we talk about energy, we can say that uh, maybe the topic is exotic for the general public. So it's there where we need to put a little bit more effort uh, to show the benefits of this, uh, of this technology. And then uh, to something uh, uh, related to what uh, Guillermo said, uh, with the fact that it is easy. I would say it's not easy. <laughs> If it would have been easy, I think that we would have been full with energy geostructures around us. However, I think that us as geotechnical engineers, uh, we do have a, a, a quality that uh, I believe in it. I think that we do have the capacity to transform uh, the difficulty into the opportunity. And uh, with this, uh, with this code, I think, I think uh, it's... 
Yeah. I think Guillermo said it's easy to bring you more clients. No, just he was just trying to help with the business. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, it's relatively easy when you're doing the pies. Yeah. Keep going, uh, so, Julia. Very, very nice. So, uh, of course, uh, uh, you know, this code, uh, um, I like it very much uh, uh, that uh, out of uh, difficulty rises the opportunity because um, I think it's also the code that describes uh, very well most of our projects in green tags, but especially the project that uh, I'm about to present to you, which is actually the first project of uh, with energy foundations that uh, was implemented in Romania a few years ago uh, in Transylvania, in the northwest part of the country. And uh, it's a project uh, that uh, this December uh, we will have already two years of operational environment monitoring uh, of it. It has been for sure a project from which we have learned a lot. It has been uh, that first step that we needed to grow this on, uh, on the market and uh, gain trust in the technology. Um, because like I said, uh, when we are talking about the market, we are talking uh, uh, about very pragmatic people uh, and for them numbers are more important than anything. And usually one of the first questions in the discussions uh, would be, where did you implement this before? So uh, having this uh, first project was indeed uh, uh, one of the first challenges that we had. Uh, but we did it. It is a successful project, despite all the challenges that we had, because we did have a few. Uh, and uh, it's about the hospital. Um, and um, it's uh, the reason why I'm saying that the code out of difficulty raises the opportunity fits very well this project, because as you can imagine, energy geostructures were not considered from the beginning. It was uh, basically so uh, the site was near an existing building of, uh, of uh, an existing hospital. And uh, this is the new building that was proposed uh, for uh, investment by the public authorities. And the difficulty was given from the geotechnical point of view, right? Because we were having difficult uh, soil foundation. We were having a thick layer of uh, very compressive soil. So of course the pile foundations were um, uh, the, the uh, suitable, uh, let's say solution for, uh, for the foundation system. But in addition to that, we had an, an additional challenge in the sense that uh, uh, the entire team that was involved in the projects, so not only uh, us as designers of the infrastructure, but the entire team uh, was requested to uh, optimize the costs. So for this reason, we were also challenged on the foundation part, because uh, instead of having a general rough foundation on piles, which is a very common foundation system, we came with this atypical foundation system of isolated foundations on piles. Uh, basically, uh, that uh, uh, in the end got us to 230 piles that we equipped all of them uh, to provide energy for the hospital and the length of the piles were 10 meters depth. Now, uh, based on uh, or given uh, better said by the architectural uh, requirements, we were having different configurations for these isolated foundations, from starting from four, uh, five up to eight, uh, eight uh, uh, piles. The piles were equipped with uh, uh, the energy system in a spiral shape. And uh, at the design stage, of course, uh, uh, we identified from the beginning some advantages, but also challenges uh, of, uh, of the system. Of course, in terms of advantages, uh, we were able to reduce costs. So it is a, most, uh, a more uh, cost effective than uh, general raft foundation. And then also uh, ensure the faster execution uh, time compared to the, general, uh, to the general raft. Now, like I said, this came also with, uh, with challenges uh, because with this type of system, we had to be uh, more careful in analyzing the differential settlements. 
Uh, also, the thermomechanical behavior, given the fact that we were uh, transforming the classical foundation into an energy foundation, and then take care also in um, the energy performance of the system, because also compared to the, to the general raft, I will I did not include in my presentation because of the lack of time, the, the, the energy part, the details on the energy part, but to just briefly mention it. Um, Compared to the general raft, the piles are positioned differently. They are more, more close to each other. So, of course, this affects also the, the energy performance uh, of, uh, of the entire system. Um, from the beginning, we knew, especially because it was the first project, we knew that uh, this would be also a research project. So, from the beginning, we approached it in comparison with the general raft. This is how we did also the calculation in the design phase in in the design phase in terms of thermomechanical uh, um, assessment. Uh, and then the final goal of this uh, research project uh, was uh, to understand the behavior of such, of such system in real operational environment. But not only for, from the mechanical, thermomechanical point of view, but also from the energy point of view. Like I was mentioning uh, uh, before, it's about a different uh, positioning of the piles. And um, so we have equipped seven piles uh, that we have instrumented with sensor, temperature sensors and vibrating wires on different sections on the length of the piles. And also for the energy uh, part, uh, some of the piles, we equip them uh, with U shape and some others with spiral shape so that we can have this comparison also in terms of uh, the positioning and the configuration of the energy pipes. Now, uh, these are some uh, pictures from the actual execution. Um, our pipes, uh, uh, are a little bit uh, different. So even here we have differences from projects to projects. So we assess this with every project and we try to come up with the best solution. Uh, in this situation, uh, uh, we had the spiral shape uh, with the small diameter pipes uh, for the configuration of the energy system and the technology that we have used and that we are actually promoting in our projects with energy geostructures. Um, uh, for piles, especially piles foundation is CFA. In our case, positioning the pipes inside the reinforcement cage, we protect uh, we protect the energy system uh, with the surrounding uh, rebar system. So CFA is one of the technology that uh, is uh, uh, is suitable uh, for energy geostructures and for our uh, particular way of uh, equipment. You should. Uh... You should avoid uh, you should avoid gravel and the concrete mix in that case. Uh, we are also uh, recommending uh, 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 recipes. So when we are implementing energy piles, we are recommending the recipes of the concrete. Also in terms of fluidity of the concrete, so we are trying to take into consideration all these uh, all these aspects, so that we do not have problems with uh, the energy system when we are introducing the the piles. Uh, this is a different uh, stage of the project. It is where how deep, uh, we... uh, how deep was the water table? I saw like three meter deep. Yes, but it was variable, and we were having the uh, water flow because uh, you saw okay. that we were. So you have a... just to clarify from previous notes. Yeah, we have a water flow. And yeah. uh, like I said the other day in Mexico during one of my uh, panel sessions, water is our number one enemy in geotechnical engineering, except <laughs> except energy. In this piles. case, <laughs> <laughs> we like some water flowing around us. Yeah, we yeah. like groundwater flow in energy piles. Well, it depends on the project, yeah. right? Because when we consider the project as an energy storage, yeah, the then we don't like uh, groundwater faster. flow yeah. so much. But uh, uh, yes, in this case, but I want to mention something because I was mentioning that we had clay and then we had we had marl. We were having uh, uh, cracks and fissured uh, uh, fissured uh, uh, blocks of these materials, and that's why we were having. Uh, groundwater flow because otherwise in clay it's very difficult to have uh, groundwater flow right because of the low permeability of the material however um, 
yeah, I was showing uh, showing you here another uh, different stage of the project when we were finalizing the smashing of the top part of the piles and we were extracting the piles and preparing them for the further connections uh, that we did, that you can see here, uh, uh, the connections that were made and further on uh, prepared for the connection to the heat pump. So, um, after uh, two years of monitoring, we are still processing data. We are preparing a, a paper with this. Uh, like I said, the important lessons that we have learned, but some of uh, uh, some preliminary, let's say, conclusions and observations would be that uh, detailed investigation, and this is especially related to the design, detailed investigation and accuracy of the soil parameters are, it's extremely important. I would say even more important than a very detailed numerical advanced numerical analysis, because especially when we assess the rigidity at the top and uh, especially at the bottom of the pile, having accurate data, not only in terms of thermal parameters, but especially in terms of geotechnical parameters is very important. Um, so detailed investigation, not only in terms of types of testing, but also in terms of number of tests and number of samples collected from the site, especially when we do not have a very homogeneous uh, layering of the soil. Uh, and then also the influence of the rigidity of the entire structure uh, and on of the actual load that the suprastructure is transmitting to the foundation is also influencing the thermomechanical behavior. Um, so input parameters, uh, I would say, are extremely important in order to match what we design and what we assume in the numerical modeling or in any calculation that we do at the beginning with what we get at, uh, at the end. And then in terms of uh, energy, uh, energy performance, I would say that uh, uh, actual operational behavior is definitely influencing the receiving of the data. Uh, and we have learned a lot about how to adjust even this monitoring uh, uh, monitoring system, but especially other monitoring systems that we have installed in other projects. This has helped us adapt uh, the view on how to uh, how to um, adapt the monitoring system uh, if we are aiming for real operational environment detailed uh, and a comprehensive uh, analysis. And uh, uh, last but not least, I would say that uh, uh, we hear everywhere now about the energy crisis, about the stress, about the energy, the energy prices and so on. And in the, at the end of the day, it's uh, the energy crisis behind the energy crisis. But I think that uh, if we look at it as geotechnical engineers on a global perspective, I think that it's important to um, bring in a more front way uh, our role towards the society, use what we have in a smart way. And here I uh, referring to foundations, to uh, tunnels, uh, to uh, walls, uh, any type of structure that interacts with the soil is a potential source of energy. And uh, from this perspective, I do believe that energy just structures are smart solutions that provide local renewable um, energy sources for the community. And I think uh, that this is very important and we need to keep going with this. So with that being said, thank you very much. This is great. What a nice way to conclude. I like the, the guy was tired. <laughs> Hopefully our audience is not tired. <laughs> uh, guys, I cannot thank you enough for your time and the energy you put in this from the global aspect of the subject to the uh, modeling and geomechanical modeling, theoretical aspect and the final uh, theory to practice uh, that I like very much. Thank you all. I think uh, this is one of uh, this will be one of the greatest talk I think in the history of <laughs> the society. I really like it, and uh, it will help a lot of young people uh, be uh, encouraged to apply and implement uh, anytime they have a project like this. I have a surprise for you. I bought a house, a penthouse in downtown Beirut 
<laughs> and guess what I'm doing on the upper level of the garden? Direct cooling under the grass. I have like 200 meters square of grass and I'm putting pipes. I don't know what I'm going to get, but I don't want to put a heat exchanger. So I'm sending uh, air into those pipes and distributing to the house below the grass. Hopefully it will work. So uh, I cannot preach if I don't do it myself. I did it. So I wish everybody goes with that idea and um, it's a mission and um, to promote saving our planet is very, very important. And this technical committee is doing a good and fantastic job. Thank you very much.